This is Larry Lawton, and he's an ex-jewel thief. Larry's a former career criminal, once considered the biggest jewel thief in the United States. So we're driving, I'm doing this. I'm literally like this. And people are looking at you like you're crazy. Well, everybody, here we are for chapter 14, Free at Last. Uh, it's a pretty good chapter. Brings back a lot of memories. Got some information coming up at the end of this video, so make sure you stay tuned until the end of the video. Some great stuff coming out real, real soon here. Uh, first of all, at the, the Free at Last, here I was. I was in Forest City, Arkansas. They called me to R&D, and guess what? I'm going home. Well, when they take you down to R&D, the first thing they do to you is they close out your account that night. And what I mean by that is your commissary, your phone is shut down, your commissary, you, so you can't make a phone call even though you have a phone number. And in prison, to make a phone call, you have to have a person's number on a list, then you call them. When they get that phone call, it says to the person who answers, uh, this call is coming from a federal institution, would you like to accept the, uh, if they don't accept the charge, you put money on your own phone, uh, would you like to accept this phone call? Please hit five. If you hit seven, you now deny that person ever from calling. So it's a pain in the ass to do that. I actually advise people when they get in a harass or their father or, or somebody they love is really abusing the phone system to do that. But anyway, so now I have nothing off. I In the last chapter, I talked about how I gave all my stuff away, but now I'm called. You called about... Four in the morning, you go to R&D. That's receiving and discharge. So they start processing you out. So when the guard starts processing me out, I had 200, I think $275. I had $250 in my account, give or take a number. I did forget a little bit. And, uh, and they give you $25 gate money, they call it. So they give me the money. They give me the $25 gate money. And they put it in, the guy counts out $275 and gives it to me. And I looked at the money and I said to him, I said, where do I cash this money in? And he looked at me and goes, this is money. I said, listen, don't, don't fuck with me. Where, where, do I, where do I get my real money? He says, no, that's real money. You got to remember when I went to prison in 1996, now it's 2007, money changed, money changed three times. It's now has color in it. There's these like, like, if you take up a, a bill and you look, it's got like a hologram in it. None of that happened before I went in. So I really thought this was like money. You go to a bank and they'll give you real money. I thought it was like, like a, an exchange, a ticket exchange. Kind of like our old food stamps used to be or something of that nature. So he convinces me it's real money. I don't believe him. I was already abused in the prison system. They screwed me over so many ways. I end up taking the money and they also give you a plane ticket. And the clothes they dress you in. I didn't want anybody to send in clothes for me. I wanted to go home. Now, remember, I was offered from family and friends to come get me. But I didn't want it. I wanted to be free. I wanted to be on a bus. I wanted to go across the country in a bus to my halfway house free without handcuffs and shackles. So here I am. They give me a plane, uh, bus ticket. I'm taking a bus from Forest City, Arkansas. To Tampa Bay, Florida is where my halfway house is. Tampa Bay, Florida. So here I am. They process you out. Now you wait. You wait in a cell. You don't just wait and walk around. You're actually in the holding cell. And you're waiting for them to actually get a car and a, and a driver to take you to the bus station. They don't want you hanging around their city longer than you have to be. So what you're doing is you're literally... Getting your, your stuff. Now they, they dress you in. They dress you in blue jeans, boots, or if they don't have your size of boots, they give you those bobo, those blue bobo sneakers. If they don't have your size in boots, they get boots, a pair of white socks, jeans, a white, uh, like a button-down shirt or a polo shirt. They gave me a polo shirt. And it just, you look like an inmate. Trust me. If you saw a person like this, you'd say, well, I could tell an inmate immediately. Well, the guy gets you about 7.30, a quarter to 80. You know, he said, come on, Lawton, you're going to a bus station. So you 
get your stuff. You don't have anything. Anything you want to bring with you, you could take. I took the, the necessities that I thought I needed in a bag. Mostly it was my legal work. So I did have legal paperwork. So they take me, brings me in there, guard gets me right to the bus station, drops you right off like at five minutes to eight. I'll never forget that because at five minutes to eight, at eight o'clock, the bus was going there. And it's a Greyhound bus. It's a regular bus ticket. So the bus pulls up. You're waiting there for five minutes. Bus pulls up. You get on the bus. You give him your ticket. And the guy just says, okay. And you go and you sit back. I go about halfway down and I see an empty seat. And I sit down at the empty seat, and it was a blonde next to me. Middle age, maybe in her 20, 25, 23, something like this. Good looking girl. Never forget this. So we're driving. I'm doing this. I'm literally like this. And people are looking at you like you're crazy. I'm doing that because I was in handcuffs and shackles and leg irons like this for so long that you, you don't even realize it. You are. Me, in my case, I was in black boxes. But you have leg irons, a chain going up to your shackles. And you're, and you're traveling like this all over. So now I'm free. I'm literally a free man. I'm on a bus, free. I sit down. The girl's sitting next to me. And I said to the girl, I'll never forget this. She had a razor flip phone. If anybody remembers, today they have you know bigger phones. They have the iPhones and all this kind of stuff. I didn't even have an iPhone. Back then, they had the Razor flip phone. But a Razor flip phone to me was like the biggest deal in the world. Because when I went to prison, if you guys remember the gray Motorola phones, I'm going to put a picture up right here. Right here. A gray Motorola phone with the, with the antenna. I used to say I can make a great commercial. I can use that phone to beat somebody and make a phone call. Because I literally did. Back in the day, I had that phone and I'd hit people with it. But anyway, those, those are the phones I had. Those big things you hold here. It looked like a walkie-talkie from an army set. So here I am. I have the, this lady sitting next to me. I say, can I, can I see your phone? Think of how that sounds. If I asked you right now looking at this video and I said to you, hey, can I see your phone? What would you look at me like? Who's this guy, crazy? What does he want my phone for? Well, I'm not going to give him my phone. Well, here's this guy all tatted up, this big guy. And, and this girl looked at me. And she hands me her phone. And I'll never forget, it was a phone just like this phone here. It was like this, but it was a Razor flip phone. This is an actual phone today. It's my mom's phone. And I'm going to show you why I have it here. But it was like that phone, and it was opened. And I looked at the phone. I'm thinking, how can these fingers touch these buttons? And I closed the phone. It was a Razor flip phone. And I gave it back to her. I hung up on whoever it was for sure. And she was like looking at me like I'm a weirdo. And I'm doing stuff like this, looking around. I mean, I see a different kind of car. Never forget, I saw the Chrysler 300s. To me, it looked like a Rolls Royce. A Chrysler 300 looked like a Rolls Royce. I haven't seen a car in 11 years. So here I am. I'm on the bus. I'm going. And, and I'm like, this is great. Here I am. I'm free. And I'm looking and th thinking about that phone and now, I did have coins. They did give me, I asked for a dollar's worth of coins. So I did have money, but a dollar's of coins. So I'm just going and, and going. And all of a sudden, the, the bus driver says to everybody there, he goes, okay, everybody, because we're pulling in to get gas. He goes, you got 45 minutes to get something to eat. And gas. They said, I'm, the, my, my brain was so out of whack. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? What am I going to eat at a gas station? When I went to prison in 1996, a gas station sold cigarettes, beer, candy bars. What are you going to give me at a gas station? Nah, this gas station, I will never forget, had a Subway store, had a food mart, and I think it had a McDonald's too, but I know it had the Subway because I remember the big commercial with that guy, Jared, and they used to show the commercial with him and the big pants, size big, and he's in them. Well, now that fucker's in a, in a prison for doing shit to kids, and I'm glad he's in prison, and I hope he's got getting what's coming to him. That's a whole nother video. But anyway, so I remember here I'm, I want to go to Subway. I want to go and get something to eat. Any person who's ever been in prison, any of you dudes out there watching this, you can verify it to your friends. 
You ask any dude who's been in prison what they miss most. What do they miss most? If you ever been in prison for a year or more, what do you miss most? They're not going to say sex. You think, oh man, you miss pussy or something. You're not going to say sex. You know what they're going to say? Food. Because you don't get to eat right in prison. You eat garbage. You eat a bologna sandwich if you're lucky. You get an apple when you travel. You get a piece of fruit. You get a pack of outdated crackers and, and a jungle juice, a little container. That's outdated. It's crazy, but everyone will tell you they miss food. So here I am. I got money in my pocket. I see a Subway. What do you want? I want a Subway sandwich. I want it so bad. So I get up, get off the bus. I'm, everybody files off the bus. We get in. People go to different venues. And we got, no, we got 45 minutes. So it's a long time. And we go up and I get online. You're talking about never forget. I, I get online. I'm, look, I'm getting the goosebumps. Man, this is weird. I, I'm online and it's a co- person in front of me. I'm just like looking around. There's a lot of people. I don't like a lot of people around me. But I, I'm doing it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm functioning in society. So it gets up to my turn. And the girl's at the counter. She says, what do you want? And I'm looking up. And she says it again. And I froze. I started shaking. You know, the, my, my, my goosebumps are going all over me. Because I felt people looking at me. And I couldn't make a choice. I literally could not make a choice. I felt like I was tongue-tied. I just couldn't choice. People are looking at me. You could feel the tension. And if you're a prisoner, trust me when I tell you you have a sixth sense, the way people look, the way they dress, the way their hand moves, the way they cock their head, the way their eyes shift, you can feel and you know when tension's around. And I felt it. And I freaked out. And I turned around and I walked off that line and back on the bus. And I will never forget, I sat in the back of that bus and I was crying like a baby. And, and, and I'm all right to say that now. But I was crying like a baby and I didn't eat for 20 hours. 20 hours I didn't eat. And I'll tell you what, it, it, was, the, it was the most amazing feeling in the world. I wanted to be locked up. I was so close to snapping and possibly killing somebody, doing something violent to somebody to get back incarcerated. I did not want to be free. It's the weirdest feeling in the world. You want to be free. You're longing to be free. You're in prison. But I was so institutionalized. And I couldn't eat. I couldn't order a sandwich. So the bus gets going. I'm in the back in the corner. I'm not even in the seat I was because there's no assigned seats on the buses. I'm in the back, in the corner. I remember because it was right near the bathroom. And I, I was like a, I was like this big, big mental case out in the back of the bus. Literally in the corner. My back in the corner. Really freaking out the whole way. Well, the bus pulls into another stop. They have stops along the way. It's a Greyhound bus station. And I get out of the bus and I had the coins. And I'll never forget. I called my cousin Cheryl. To this day, I just saw her. Love her with all my heart. This woman saved my life. I call Cheryl, who works with people. She works with uh, 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 different groups. She's an, one of the most intelligent women you ever ever meet. She does life groups and stuff, and power. She's done you know stuff with monks. She's an amazing woman. So Cheryl gets me on the phone, and I'm telling her what happened, and she says, "Calm down, Larry." She she goes, "You have what they call sensory overload." Your body and your mind can't handle all the new choices that are thrown at you. And here I am freaking out. And when I say freaking out, I mean freaking out. And I'm on the bus. And then she says, just just go back on the bus. Stay the way you are. Don't interact with people. Get to where you're going and you'll feel better when you're incarcerated. Because I'm going to a halfway house. And a halfway house is incarceration. You're not free you just got, it's a lot less rules than actual behind the walls and then the fences so it's a different but it is still incarceration she saved my life she told me all about sensory overload and I tell people to this day about that all the time so I get back on the bus 
I stay there and we get to Tampa Bay, Florida. We're in Tampa Bay, Florida and we get off the bus and the first thing I wanted to do, and they gave you a phone number to call. They said where you are and you make a phone call and they'll tell you what to do when you get there. So we're going to a fair halfway house in Tampa, Florida, still there to this day. It's the Goodwill Industries runs the halfway houses in Tampa. And I, I'm sure a lot of other places around the country. So I go in and I make a phone call right at the, the depot where we're at. And I say, I'm, I'm here. What do I do? They said, you could take a cab or you could take a bus. I forget a bus. Forget even thinking about a bus. I take a cab. I told them where to go. Had the money ready. And I got to the halfway house. So I get to the halfway house and they check you in. And I can honestly say I felt relief. Being incarcerated again, I felt relief. Now, the halfway house is built and are totally different than prison. It's not fences and walls or none of that. You walk into the halfway house and have a guy who's in like an office. You want to call it that a, 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 a glass thing for a gate. You want to call it a gate. It's just where you check in. A visitor would check in. It's like any any building and have like a, a an office in the back. The guy sits in that in that office and then people have to come in after sign in and they'll tell them where they're going. Well, I get there and the guy goes, okay, hold on. Someone will be with you and we'll check you in. So they check me into the halfway house and they send me to a room and the room has six beds in it. Six beds, three on one wall, three on the other. And there's a bathroom in the back with two uh, showers in it. Nice, really nice privacy, all of that kind of stuff. And... When I got there, I was in the best shape of my life. And here's a picture right here. I was in the best shape of my life. I mean, I was, I was rock hard. Man, I was ready to go. That's when I was doing the most push-ups, most sit-ups. I was just a, an animal in shape like that. But so you're in the halfway house. So now when you're in the halfway house, you got to find out how things go in the halfway house. So what do you do? You, they, they come and they give you what they call orientation. You have to get a job. Here's the racket of a halfway house. I should open them. Here's the racket. Every inmate in that halfway house has to get a job. Now, when they get the job, let's just, I'm going to give a number. You make 200 bucks for the week. Before taxes, 200 bucks. You make 10 bucks an hour and you work 20 hours. And they give you $200. The check says $200. They don't give you the $200, obviously. You know, you got taxes taken out on that. But the halfway house wants 25% of the $200. So $50 comes right off the top. They get the halfway house. And you now have to pay taxes even on their $50 and everything else. And the prison gives the halfway house, the last time I checked, was $61 a day per inmate. So if they got 100 inmates in that facility, they're getting $61 per day for every one of those inmates in that halfway house. Some are different, some are more, some are less. That's last time I looked actually to do something like this. But here's the thing. The halfway house is supposed to try to help you adapt to society. To try to, try to help you integrate it to society. So they, they say you have to get a job. They just want you to get a job so that you can pay, obviously. So... They actually set the job up. They listened to this job they set up for me. They set a job up. I was a customer service rep for Verizon Telephone. Think of that. You know when you call those Verizon numbers and you want to upgrade your account, they get a guy. You most probably are getting an inmate who just got out of prison. And they, you're giving me your address, your name, your last four, your social security number. All of this stuff, let your credit card number, everything it takes, you put that in the system. That's who you're giving it to. I know people, I used to get blown away thinking if people really knew who they were giving their information to. I didn't do anything with it, of course. I didn't care about that. I ended up meeting a girl there and I got laid for the first time out of prison. Talk about wild. Oh man, she was a beautiful girl sitting next to me. She was a former inmate herself. Now she's been out. She's not under the halfway house. She was really good at what she did. She used to help me. And I'll tell you what, a girl was a good girl, meaning a fun girl to be around, talk to us, helped us, because a lot of the new inmates would come from the halfway house there. 
And then when they're done with their half ass, most of them leave, go where they're going. I'm from Melbourne area, Melbourne, Florida area, which is the east coast of Florida, where I'm going back to my mom's house. But this halfway house, the closest one they had was Tampa, Florida, which is totally on the west coast of Florida. It's not going to be really good. And it's so funny that they're supposed to try to help you get you a job, do what they're going to do. And at that time, phones, they had cell phones. Everyone was getting them. In fact, you could barely find, this is back in 2007. You still had some pay phones out, but they were, they were diminishing very quickly. And you'd think you'd need a cell phone. The halfway house wouldn't let you have a cell phone. Don't ask me why. Their policy was no cell phone. I have no clue why. You're supposed to be helping people integrate back into society and you don't want to help. You couldn't even have a computer. You couldn't buy yourself a laptop computer and try to learn on a computer. I'm not talking about a guy who has no... I don't have a charge of computer fraud or child molestation or anything crap like that. I have nothing where I shouldn't have been allowed to try to own a computer or have a cell phone. So what we did, I'm going to show you guys something pretty cool. I made this to sneak a cell phone in. You see, this is the kind of cell phones. This is actual cell phone today works. This is my mom's cell phone. I borrowed it just to show you guys. And this is the kind of cell phone they had back in those days. And they still have them today, obviously. You know, it's a working phone. But we weren't allowed to have them. And they would search you coming in and out of the halfway house. I went and bought a transistor radio. I took the guts out of a transistor radio. And I made it so this phone or the phone of these sides actually fit right in there. And you'd snap it shut. Now you cannot tell me this is not a perfectly working radio. Unless, even I used to keep it like this. So I would walk into the halfway house like this. And a guy go, what do you listen a lot? And I go, ah, oh, the ball game. You know, or this radio station I love. Oh, okay. And the weight of this, the weight is just like it would be. Look, look, it doesn't make any noise. There's a cell phone in here. So I would get back into my room with the guard, they didn't call them guards, whatever they were, and here is my cell phone. And I would use that and then call people and I learned about a cell phone and I had to cheat to do that. Isn't that crazy? I had to make this device up this is crazy, but I made, and, you know, it was funny because I was going through my stuff and I actually have this and I don't ever want to get rid of this stuff. See how it snaps right in? And that that's what it was. And it's not really a, a working radio, of course, but that's what I used. If that's not wild, nothing is, you know? So it's just crazy what I had to do. And with the, with the, uh, for a, for a cell phone, you would think the halfway house would want to help you out. Anyway, but to be honest, that how halfway house in Tampa wasn't that bad. So I'm in I'm in the halfway house. I'm messing around with a broad. I'm I, I'm learning a cell phone. They had a computer at the facility that you can go on, but everybody wants to get on it. And this is 2007. Computers were pretty regular. Hell, I mean, they just came out in 96, 95, 94 when I was out. So now, of course, they were a whole different ball game, but you'd think they would let you have them? No. So here I'm doing pretty good. I'm messing around with abroad. I'm, I'm actually doing good at this place. No one I'm ever going to be there, though. I'm going back to where I live to, to have a home. I'm lucky. I'm a blessed inmate to have had a mom and a dad. And... Uh, so being I had all of that, I had a roof over my head and stuff more than other inmates. I didn't worry, worry really about saving that money either. So I just had it and I can go out. But you can't party. You can't buy things. You can't buy food. The halfway house has that. They had a lady that came in and made sandwiches and stuff like that. And when you went to the work, you can literally uh, take a bag lunch. And it was just really crazy. I'll tell you what was the funny part was 
you know they were making money off that company because giving them them employees. Because it's kind of like they know what they get. And who knows how many kickbacks were going on. <coughs> so we're in there. All of a sudden I get word. 12 of us inmates in that facility, that halfway house, were getting transferred. They started a new halfway house in Orlando, Florida. Only an hour and 10 minutes away from my house where I live. Oh man. I didn't really want to go. Because it was a new facility and who knows how it's going to be run and all that. Brand new facility in Orlando. It's open to this day. So I get on the bus. They transfer everybody there in a bus. They get us all there. We get to the halfway house. And actually, I didn't go on that bus. I had my dad's car. I ended up getting my license there. And my dad gave me a 1994 Aqua Blue Buick Skylark. My dad had the start of Alzheimer's, and he messed up the whole side of the car, but he, so he gave me this car, and it was messed up, but it was a 90, it was, it, to me, it was a Cadillac, and it, thank you, dad, and loved it, and all that, and so I ended up driving myself and two other inmates to the new halfway house, so we get to the new halfway, we're the first inmates in this new halfway house, and you want to talk about a screwed up facility. I'm in this halfway house, and they don't know what they're doing, who to go, how to how to put people, where to live, what you can use, what cell phones, what no recreation. You had to sit there and do not, literally do nothing. They had one TV for everybody. Now people are coming in every day, and they have no idea what they're doing. In fact, I found out later that it eight directors. They used eight directors in the first year. Because nobody knew what they were doing at this halfway. They were taking college age people, 25, 27, making them the director of this halfway house against 45 year old guys like myself who come from a pretty rough environment. And you're going to treat me like a piece of shit, like a, like a piece of garbage, talk down to me like I'm a nobody. I don't know where they got their training. So I'm at this halfway house a week. One week, and I said, I got to get out of here. These people have no clue what they're doing, can't do anything. I said, listen, I want out of this place. Get me out of this place. They can't, oh, you gotta, you, you got to really try to adjust to this. I ended up telling the director of half the house, I'm going to kill this motherfucker. If this, I will kill this fucking guy. Within an hour, within an hour, the U.S. Marshals were at the facility picking me up, taking me to the Seminole County Jail. And, you know, in prison, you get what they call shots or demerits, whatever you call them. In prison system, they call them a shot. They didn't even give me a shot because they knew how screwed up this halfway house was. But they were sending me back to prison. They're literally going to send me back to prison. And that was okay. They sent me back to prison. No problem with sending me back to prison. I had no problem. So here I am. I'm getting heading back. I'm going to the Seminole County Jail. I'm in the Seminole County Jail about one month, about three weeks to a month. Now, I only have total of another probably three weeks left before I'm get, totally my discharge date. August 24th, 2007 was my discharge date. And I'm getting out of prison for good. But first, here it is. Uh, I'm in July sometime, and I'm heading back to prison. I am going to Coleman Prison. I get called from the county jail. I'm in the county jail. I'm in Seminole County Jail. And Seminole County Jail, county jail suck. But they sent me to what they call the felony pod. The felony pod is where, you know, the murderers and the, and the armed robbers and the stuff, the felons. Listen, I'm a convict. I know how to last in facilities like that. That's my home. That that was like bringing me back to home. So I ended up going to the felony pot of Seminole County Jail. And I ended up getting transferred to uh, Coleman Prison. And I'm going to talk about that in part two of this uh, chapter. Free at last. Because it's a really cool part coming up. Uh, I hope you're liking it. You're going to hear a, a really great part two of this on Thursday. Listen guys, I'm loving it. I really do. I hope you're liking everything we're doing. You can listen to this chapter in the link on Spotify and iTunes in the links below. Check out the link below for a bunch of stuff. I told you I had some news coming up. 
please don't go and buy books that you're seeing on Amazon for $100, $120. I saw a book for $135 of my books. We just placed our order. We're taking pre-orders starting now so you can go online and go. There's a link below to get our book. We, uh, Gangster Redemption, we're taking pre-orders. The book, you'll have your book in three to five weeks. I'm going to be signing them. We're putting on a on a special edition, a YouTube special edition version. Uh, we're only buying 3,000 books. So we're limiting them to two books per email. So if you want to buy them, you can only buy two. So everybody gets a shot, two books, and it's going to be 20 bucks. And I'm personally going to sign every book. I'm going to sign every book that comes through to pre-order on the special edition books from YouTube. Uh, I'm loving this so much, but people have been asking for the books and they've been getting screwed. And I'm not going to screw anybody. I said it's 20 bucks. I'm not going out and buying $50, $60. It's crazy what I'm seeing online, and that's what really made it. I just got word back that the books will be done in the next week and a half. So by the time you get them, it'll be about, I'm saying three to five weeks, you will have your books in hand. Just do the pre-order. The link is below. Make sure you check out the link. That's the only way you're going to get the pre-order. Don't go anywhere else. Get the pre-order from me. Uh, the books are crazy. You know, check out our merch, you know, my cup or we got the, the shirt. I really appreciate the support. I have literally over 100 videos lined up. We're going to have the Untold Stories chapter. All some stories and robberies you guys didn't hear about. I'm doing a cooking video. I'm doing a bunch of stuff on stuff we used to make like this kind of stuff. Tattoo guns. Shank stuff I used to do for suitcasing. I know you're gonna see it. I know it's crazy. I'm not gonna suitcase it online. I got a whole court series coming up. I'm doing movie reviews. You guys really came back with the GTA. You'd love my GTA review. I'm gonna be doing a payday review, and I'm gonna be doing more GTA reviews. So keep coming with the comments. I uh, I keep trying to answer all these comments. I keep putting stuff up there. The book has been a big one. A lot of people really want the book. And for 20 bucks, it is an amazing book. And you're going to have a special edition that we're putting a, a, a logo on the front. YouTube special edition is only 3000 I'm printing. And so it's going to be a pretty pretty powerful, powerful we'll have thing up because we will be making a movie on this. I actually have been contacted. And hopefully a movie gets made and maybe a TV show or series as well. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate your, your love, your support. I'll never forget. I know I love the, the meme that's coming up. I'm learning all this stuff. Be bear with me, guys. We're going to have a whole thing, a whole prison uh, uh, series on how to help people in prison, how to do stuff. You know, I'm all for prison reform. I'm all for fixing this broken system and criminal justice reform. Don't give up on people, man. If you know somebody out there, please don't give up on them. But better even than that, don't make bad choices. Please make the right choices now. Don't go have to go through what I went through. Don't lose your kids and don't lose the things that meant the most to you. I love you guys. I really do. Appreciate all the support. Keep it coming. Keep passing the word. Thanks. I really appreciate it.